Welcome to Team Perry's Step Out of Line podcast, featuring co-hosts Perry and Lori Finkelstein. Together, they explore, meet, and share inspirational stories with guests who have made a positive impact in today's world. This podcast resonates with our hope to make this world a better place one step at a time through love, acceptance, and uplifting conversations. My entire life, probably similar to Perry, I'm going to going to assume we have a lot of similar life paths considering both of our disabilities are congenital. So we've been kind of growing up with it. I feel like I actually know that I've been forced to step out of line most of my life to advocate for the opportunities that I wanted, not the opportunities that society said were fit the persona or the role of being the disabled kid or the disabled high schooler or the disabled young adult or the disabled executive in the workplace. And so I think the path has required of me to step out of line to achieve the things that I wanted to achieve in my life. If I wouldn't have, I think I would have been pigeonholed into opportunities and a career path and really everything under the sun that would have been directed by societal's perception of what somebody with a disability can do, specifically a woman. So I think it's been required of us. And when I was young, it wasn't something that I wanted or that I necessarily chose. It was just like part of the path. Choosing to step out of line now in my 40s, I would say I'm in the most secure place that I've ever been as a disabled woman. I still have my own self-doubts. I still have my own insecurities every day. I have to check that all the time. But now in the space that I'm in with my business, I am choosing actively to step out of line pretty much daily with my advocacy, with the clients that I work with, on the stages that I get on. I think depending on the time of life, the season of life, it was a choice or a requirement or somewhere in between. I don't think people are born with that hard skin that they, oh, I'm this is going to be a step out of line person. I think you kind of evolve into it. You're not born into it. You have to change reality in the way that it's protected to you. That means protected and that means not fair. That means People are ready for it, and it's not what you're set up to do. And I think that, like, I think it's really just part of that, but also personality traits. It's not really at all, but it's just that we were over time as a person, what just happens to have this ability, you develop this step down line persona. And really just say, hey, I'm going to take charge of my life, whatever that looks like. I give a lot of credit to the early lessons of my parents. Like, my parents are a lot like your mom, you know, or they were. They pushed me to be as independent and confident in, in the space that I was in. And when I was born. I was born with an identical able-bodied twin and they weren't expecting to have twins. That was before ultrasounds. I didn't know one was going to have a disability. Like there was just the whole thing was a big surprise. And their philosophy immediately was like same opportunities for both. And they went into advocating pretty immediately because when I was in school, it was like, segregation of kids with disabilities, you know, all of that, no ADA, there was no, you know, Rehabilitation Act was just passed. So there was a lot of advocacy that my parents, specifically my mom, really had to do to advocate for me to have a space to be the only kid mainstreamed, to be included like my able-bodied twin sister. And my mom passed away when I was seven. And before she died, my dad would tell me the story off and he laid in bed and, you know, she was writing us letters about what she wished for us in the future. And she said to him, like, the, the one thing that I'm, I want that I, I need you to do is to make sure that Alicia 
is a strong, independent woman, so she is going to be okay when we're gone. And he took that very seriously. And that meant to him when I was seven, you know, only adapt the things that were necessary. You know, I had to navigate environments like getting glasses out of the top shelf, or I had the accessibility that I needed to make things happen, but he strategically left things also as they were because again there was no ADA there wasn't accessibility there and he knew that I was going to have to navigate a life that was going to be pretty rough and I think those things were very foundational my mom also before she passed away put me into wheelchair tennis I was the first kid to ever play wheelchair tennis with the founder of tennis back in like 80 there was this newspaper in the article brad parks is the one that that founded wheelchair tennis and he had a skiing accident his spinal cord injury and he was very athletic before his injury and wanted to keep playing so he started doing these clinics out of rehab and they created the sport of wheelchair tennis that you see everywhere now and my mom approached him and said hey will you teach my daughters how to play tennis and so i was the first junior they built me the first junior wheelchair tennis chair and it was a sport that we could play inclusively and so they were strategically like embedding these things that taught me to be one with my chair through play taught me to be strong fit competitive have that drive to want to win and i think that along with learning to adapt to my environment to fit in with my sister i mean she was a strategy too that's translated into keep going go after it get it go 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 and it translated into my career into my schooling all of that so i think those were pretty foundational when i was young and having parents like you it's a strategy you know like if you have a a parent that is like let's go you can do anything and you can even do the things I might not believe, but I'm not going to say, but I'm going to let you try. Th those are the foundational lessons that help us as kids growing into our disability and into our independence soar, in my opinion. Was there ever a point where you could remember, because I know I had hit this point a few times with Perry, like as a parent, I had to give up on something. I pushed and pushed and tried to get Perry to into something or do something. And I, at some point, I had to learn when I had to fight my battles and when just to let it go. And I have a very hard time letting go. Do you think your dad felt that or he was just like, sink or swim, let's go? My dad's gone now too. So from what I can remember, it really was kind of sink or swim. And I think it was his way of pushing me, but I also think it was his way of dealing with emotionally my situation like the stuff that my dad had to deal with me as a young girl is the stuff that your mom does you know what I mean we're talking about surgeries and cath like just the whole thing and every time I would go into a surgery you know he would just be like all right this is it it's game time no crying go get it done and I just think it was his way of making me number one know it's game time. This is part of life. Go do it. And also, he, I think he didn't want to see me afraid and didn't want to see me cry and didn't want to see me be fearful of these, you know, I mean, Perry knows, you all know, I'm sure you've been through a million medical things as well. And that's the tough stuff, right? So I don't want to use the word tough love because he wasn't mean or hard, but he really was like sink or swim, like let her struggle like my grandma would want to pick me up and don't touch her leave her let her figure it out I think it probably you know looked tough from an outsider looking in if you're not embedded in kind of what's going on in the family but he was so dedicated to fulfill my mom's wish he took it so seriously that it worked. When you found your husband were you looking for the same qualities that your dad had when you were looking for somebody to marry? When we decided to get married, probably. But when I found my husband, we were 12. We used to go to kids camp, sports camp together. You know, there was a camp that we would go to once a year. We get pulled out of school that I would go to an environment and every kid, every coach, every person would be a wheelchair user. And it was the only time where you could 
play with kids that look like you. You could disappear. My favorite part was going into the gym and literally disappearing. Like you couldn't pick me out of the crowd. And so my husband and I met there. He'd pull my ponytail. He'd dump me out of my chair. Like that was like, you know, we were playful and, and we ended up competing on the tennis tour together as young adults and then started dating and then later got married. So we've been in each other's lives since we were kids. Perry had summer camp, which is where she felt one of a hundred girls in wheelchairs. So she felt that same feeling I think that you felt. And one time we had stalked her, my husband and I, when she went off to camp at the age of eight, I think for the first time, and we were staying in like a local hotel, it was upstate, and we heard they were at the bowling alley. So we went to the bowling alley and I, and I go in and I said to the bowling alley man, um, have you seen a girl in a wheelchair? We're looking for a daughter. And they were like, he goes, pick one. And they were like, you know, 25 of them there. And we just laughed because we were idiots. I think when you were telling of your experience, I think Perry probably felt that same experience where she finally was Perry, not the girl in the wheelchair. I didn't think I would marry somebody with a disability. I thought I needed somebody to carry me up a mountain if I needed it. And he's got spinal cord injury. He can stand and he can walk with a brace and stuff. Mine's a little bit more severe. I've only dated like him and one other man with a disability. And other than that, it was all able-bodied guys. And they just didn't love me as much. There was always like this undertone of being a little bit embarrassed or I could just tell they weren't fully, I could tell they loved me, but they didn't, I don't think they saw this situation for their life or we were too young for them to accept it as, you know, we were intimate. We did all the things, but when it was like from a social acceptance standpoint, every single time there was some weird, I just never felt good enough, honestly. So my husband, you know, he's the one that has loved me deeper than any other man. And He's also the one that when I go have surgery, will, you know, wipe my rear end. <laughs> I need it. That doesn't make me less attractive to him. Like he understands the path. And so it's been a really beautiful like life of him and I growing up together and figuring out disability. And then we ended up getting married. I couldn't, I couldn't believe I married a guy with a disability, to be honest with you, with you when I did. But the best decision I ever made. How do you feel about dating with uh, disability? I hate to have my single my friend. I don't want to marry her. I don't want to I don't want to survive for me. I think I can't take care of them. I don't know how anyone else can take care of them. I have so much going on. So I, and I need someone that currently in the medical field that Really Who could carry up a mountain if he had to, right. and a wheelchair and a ventilator. Yeah, and not complain. And not yeah. complain about it. I love that we're talking about this. I don't think we're talking about relationships and dating and intimacy enough as women with disabilities. And I, I think a lot of people are curious about it. And I think that it's starting to become more of a conversation. But like from my perspective. I don't see very many dual wheelchair user couples like you see able-bodied and wheelchair, whatever. And so not that one is better than the other, because I agree with you. Like it just, whoever you fall in love with, you fall in love with. But one of the biggest things that I've not liked being categorized as, you know, is being like asexual and like not interested in intimacy and not wanting like, you know, society thinking that we can't date and we're, you know, there's too much medical supplies and things going on at all. And it's just like, it's such a false narrative that I think we need to be squashing a little bit. I don't think that I see me as like a potential person that can do with that. Like, I'm not conventionally pretty in the sense that I do have a lot of pain and I'm in a wheelchair and I don't want. Right on the outside, but I, I think they're there for that. And I think that's a problem too. And not that I'm actively looking or looking at all, 
but I hope one day I find someone that's like, oh, I'm not serious or minister. I want to find out more about her. I want to know her. You're young. Like, that will happen. And I know that, like, from your perspective, like, there might definitely is probably on the outside more visibility of some of the medical challenges, right? For me, like, I can hide it, right? Like, I can hide the things under my clothes that I have to hide. But in intimate situations, like, I have a stoma, like, I use cats, but, like, there's all kinds of things that are visible when you get into a, a situation that you're intimate and it's really hard like it's really really hard it's really uncomfortable it's really and and you know I have felt the same way most through my 20s like it took me maybe even early 30s to just be like in accepting my own self and my own body and my everything that comes with it to to not be so afraid to go there <laughs> and I didn't hit that until I was in my 50s, actually. See? So, I mean, you know, when you just say, the hell with it, this is me. You're losing your mom at such a young age. And I know that was, from a mom, that was my fear, that who would be there to take care of her? And I think when Perry became 18, I started to give her more of her own health care to deal with. And I still do that. Like I make sure she knows everything so that if something does happen to me, she'll be the one who's going to be taking care of herself and directing people. What was the age that you started to really take care of your own medical information and, and making sure you went to the doctors? Like what age were you the one who's responsible? You know, there's a few different tasks, right? Like if we're talking about the personal stuff where you're cathing and doing all that, I was probably around, you know young eight nine young and right when my mom passed away you know my dad my grandma and my great aunt there's a few strategic women that kind of stepped in to be there for not just me to be there for my siblings and I who would help with some of the things that would probably be more comfortable with a woman right and so from just a self-care that happened pretty quick not seven but definitely pre- adolescence and before all the stuff started to go down you know with growing into a woman but from a like doctor appointment management advocacy I don't remember taking that over until I was 18 mm -hmm. I had a very big surgery when I was like 14 15 my bladder was incontinent only one kidney like the internal stuff is actually the hard stuff for me too, even though you can't tell that it's there. You know, I've struggled with kidney function and all kinds of stuff my whole life. USC in LA, a doctor there created a, it was a brand new procedure. I was one of the first ones to have it. It was for bladder cancer to remove your bladder and create it out of your small intestines. And I had this like huge reconstructive surgery when I was like 14, 15. And my dad was making very smart, which were probably scary decisions too giving me the tools that were going to give me the best independence possible with the internal situation that I had. That surgery almost killed me, but I made it through and I have control. There's no accidents. I can feel when I have to go like pee, like the whole, like the whole thing has been unbelievable. It was, it's absolutely amazing. So I'd say around that age, I started to become really knowledgeable of my body and the limitations of my kidney and some of the things that I need to watch out for and make sure I'm clean and that I'm not getting infections because I was chronic infection for God, like 10 years too, and sepsis and just all kinds of serious stuff. It's been a process. And again, now in my forties, I'm really like knowledgeable and right when I was like late 30s going into my 40s I was having bladder kidney infections every six weeks I was you know I work a corporate position I was traveling all over the country getting terrible like fevers and and I got so used to it, it was like every six weeks antibiotics off a week or two then I get because I get stones in my bladder my kidney from this like reconstruction and 
And that's when I got sepsis. I like almost died on a work trip. Like it was crazy. I'm like, this has to, we need to fix this. This isn't good. I was becoming resistant to antibiotics. And my primary care doctor said, have you ever seen an infectious disease doctor? So out there for anyone with spinal cord injury, anyone who has chronic kidney infections, this was the best advice that my urologist never told me for 25 years. Have you ever seen an infectious disease doctor? And he goes, just go, go meet with this doctor. So I go meet with this doctor and she had three different plans. Start taking this little cocktail of pills that are going to help the acid in your urine. If this doesn't work, we'll move to this. If that doesn't work, we'll move to that. The first thing she did, I've been, it's like I'm on year seven or something. And I have had, I get like two kidney infections a year instead of like, I mean, we are talking every eight weeks. It changed my life. So anybody out there, like that's a really important doctor, at least it has been for me to sew into your care instead of just treating with medicine, like what can you do to like combat the infections? So that was a big deal for me. One of Perry's first doctors as a kid, once we got a team established, so she's probably at the age of two when we started really getting a great team together, was her infectious disease doctor. Who okay. is still, we didn't age out yet. We're not letting go of him. He's still her doctor. When she had COVID in September, he was instrumental in getting her better. So yes, probably the quarterback, I would say. Oh, fantastic. Right? Oh, you just gave me the chills. Yeah. You just gave me the chills. It's like the most important doctor I've ever had. Hands down. Okay. <laughs> And like, I had a moment before that, but like, this is like, really bad. And I asked him, like, why this didn't happen? Will it didn't happen again? And he's like, hey, you know, sometimes this didn't happen with this early. And, you know, it was a medicine, and like, yeah, oh, oh, oh. He's very soft and sweet with her. He never gives her shots. He gets his nurses to do it. He's still not subjected to <laughs> And he came to Perry's bat mitzvah and like, you know, you light candles at the bat mitzvah, like honoring the person who's laying the candle. And he was one of her candle lighters with Perry being 24. And she has accomplished a lot, but there's still so much more she wants to do. What advice would you have for her? The one thing that I wish that I would have done earlier is take more action. I was right, wrong, or indifferent. I had a corporate career for 17 years before I started my business in technology sales. So I made it all the way to vice president of sales at a, at a startup company and was doing really well for myself. But it took me a long time to get there. And even in my own business now, I let my insecurities of not being good enough, needing to accomplish more, maybe having to like feel like I need to accommodate for my disability to receive more opportunities. And what I wish I would have done sooner is realize my value, then be ready, literally write it down so you're ready to pitch it to say it out loud, this is why, this is my value, this is how much that I need to work for you or that I want for my raise or that I want on the speaking stage because, not because I deserve it, but because this is my value, this is my proposition, this is, this is why I deserve to be promoted or paid more or all of it. I was stagnant for a really long time, probably like eight years in a job that I wasn't getting promoted, like tiny little things, but I wasn't moving forward in the way that I knew that I should be. And I was too scared to say something. So use your voice, know your value and be ready to pitch it. Literally like writing it down and being so good at your pitch that when it is that time, you can say, this is my value, dut, 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 and this is what I need, and this is what I deserve, and this is what, after you pay me that, this is what you're going to receive from me. And those things are really strategic in moving your career forward, whether it's at a job or an entrepreneur or reaching your dreams or anything like that. So I think we as women first and foremost, need to be doing that more. And then we as women with disabilities need to be doing that even more. <laughs>
but that is hard because every time I was in the workplace and even now, sometimes I was the only one, there was no other wheelchair. I mean, there was other people with disabilities, but they were not raising their hand back then. That was not like, I'm disabled, raise your hand days. That was like, hide it, don't ask. I'm scared I'm not going to get hired. I'm scared I'm not going to get a raise. I, I can't ask for accommodations. They're going to think that, oh, why do I have to be that one? That was hard to overcome in the workplace. That's why I'm doing workplace motivational speaking and training and advocacy for disability inclusion in corporate America, because that's where I came from. And it was like, I was the only one. And it was really hard. And I wasn't a com and there would be team building events and conferences and they knew I was there. There was never any accessibility. I always had to figure things out on the fly and it was uncomfortable. I smiled most of the time and got through it right, wrong or indifferent. And so now that I'm like strong in my space and it's taken me a very long time, I'm talking about it without saying like, no, it's fine. I got it. Cause that's how I was for a really long time. No, no, no. I got it. I got it. I got it. No, no, that's not me. I don't need that. You know, I don't need that accommodation. I don't need, I was in sales. So it was like whining and dining and conferences and travel and all these things. And, you know, I'd always have to bring my car rent because there wasn't an accessible bus or there wasn't a, you know, so it was just always a thing. So know your value, pitch it and ask, do not wait for somebody to come and hand you something that you know, you deserve. You have to ask for it. And then if you don't get it, you ask again. She's much better networking through emails. And when you're in a person-to-person -person event, what do you personally do? Do you make it known, here I am, I have my mouth, I'm going to talk? How long did it take you to get into that position where you feel confident that you can bring something and people are going to listen to you and not going to say, oh, look at this chick, she's in a wheelchair? I'm just going to call that cold calling is the hardest thing to do, even for me today. When I go to networking events, if I'm not speaking and I'm just there to network, rub shoulders, make relationships, you don't wait for people to come up to you. You have to approach them. The people are not comfortable approaching us. They never have been. And that's true whether you have a disability or not. If you're at a networking event, it is the most uncomfortable thing to go sit at a table of a group that you don't know. It's so uncomfortable to walk up or roll up to someone and go, hi, I'm Alicia. I I'd love to learn about you. It Same thing on LinkedIn. I mean, I do that every single day. So I'm booking enough events so I don't have to go back to work and my business is successful, right? Every day I'm going, hi, I'm Alicia. This is what I do. You want to have a coffee? And that is totally uncomfortable <laughs> that you get better at it, right? Yeah. As time goes on. But those types of environments, they're golden for us, but you can never expect until you're Brene Brown that they're going to come over to you. you. You have to say, hi, I'm Alicia. Let me tell you a story. I got a full ride scholarship to do a master's program in Belgium, and it was for adaptive physical activity. My dream was to work for the Paralympics, and part of this program was being able to get engaged with the Paralympics. So that is why I didn't have any aspirations of getting a master's. I saw this thing in there that said, you'll get to be embedded with the Paralympic committee internationally. I signed up, I got the scholarship, I went over. And one of our first field trips, I was the only person with disability in our class. It was 35 people around the country, one per country, I went for the US. And we took a field trip. The program was in Belgium. The International Paralympic Committee was in Bonn, Germany. We took a field trip over to their headquarters. We did the whole thing. And then afterwards, I mean, all the executives were there from the Paralympic Committee. This wasn't part of the program. But afterwards, before we left, I got my confidence and I went over and I said, I'm Alicia. This is what I do. We'll be working together. I said, we will be working together one day. I did that to every executive before I left the room. And by the time I left this program, I was interning on the International Paralympic Education Committee. We wrote and created educational manuals that were distributed globally through the Paralympics. I made my dream happen, but that would not have happened if I didn't go, hi, I'm Alicia. 
And we will be working together one day. This is my dream. And this is why. And that is where being bold, being confident, even if you're faking it, because I'm faking it a lot, and that's okay. But you call plan before you go. You don't not have a plan. Okay, I am going to go introduce myself to 10 people. I am not leaving that room until I do. And I know what my elevator pitch is. It's 20 seconds. You know, I'm Alicia. This is what I do. This is the impact I'm making. I want to be a part of active change. Can we have a coffee? Because I see some similarities in our business methodology, whatever it might be. That is what you do. So you can never expect somebody to go, oh, there's Perry. I'm going to go meet her. They're not going to do it. Mm-hmm. Especially because we're disabled. They're, like, we, we are challenging human beings every single day to look us in the eye and smile, let alone have a conversation about business. So that we're breaking barriers and stereotypes and all of that you just have to keep chipping away and every single day introducing yourself to somebody new and I do it every day and it's not just one person (laughs) it's a lot I spoke at um, Etsy last year and after my event somebody reached out to me and said that I really impacted one impacted one of their employees like they don't know if they're allowed to tell me what happened blah 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 whatever A couple weeks ago, I get a LinkedIn message from this woman from Etsy and she writes me this email and it says, you know, I attended the event last year and I had my son sit on and listen to your keynote. He has an onset disability and that has affected his right or left side. And he used to play the trumpet or something. And he stopped playing music and he stayed home from school and he, you know, was just having a hard time with this disability onset. And she said, after your speech, he decided to make some commitments. He wanted to start to play the trumpet or whatever it was with his left hand. He wanted to apply to be in the school play. He would not miss any days of school, all his doctor's appointments he would book after school. And she's like, in the last six months, he hasn't missed any any school. He started playing the trumpet again, and he just performed in this play, singing and dancing. And that it it's giving me the chills. That is what we can do for for others, and it's power. It's so powerful. It's amazing. So that yeah. is the best reason to be doing this work. It's great to have a business. It's great to make money, like all that, but. The reality is, is we're an active part of change and what else could be better in our lives to make a little bit of impact? You know, I don't imagine that it's going to be so monumental, but it's enough, you know, to count. And so I think that that's really important.